Hi! If you're confused between AGM and lithium iron phosphate, or you don't know the difference between a VSR and a B2B, stay with us as we talk all things 12 volts. Thanks for watching our video, and as always, if you have any questions or feedback, please pop them in the comments below. If you find the video useful, please like, share, and consider subscribing. Today we're going to have a quick look at the basics of a 12 volt system for your van. Whether it's just for a few lights, charging phones and watching TV, or you want to include higher current devices like an inverter or 12 volt fridge. The basic concept is the same. Let's take a look. The heart of the system is your battery. To ensure you have enough power for your needs and don't use up the power in your vehicle's starter battery, a separate leisure battery is the best approach. You've then got your load made up of all the appliances you're going to use. These could be split into low current like lights, USB sockets and TV etc and higher current like an inverter or 12 volt fridge. You then have to think about how you're going to keep your battery charged up. Mains, solar and the alternator on your vehicle all provide options to do this. The concept of how these link together is pretty simple. In reality it's a little bit more difficult considering you need positive and negative and fuses for protection but overall it's reasonably simple. Let's first look at the store for your power, so your battery. Some people have used different sources of power like golf cart batteries, Tesla batteries and even submarine batteries. But for the simplicity of this video I'm only going to talk about commercially available deep cycle leisure batteries. These currently come in four main types, sealed lead acid, absorbent glass mat or AGM, gel and lithium iron phosphate. Sealed lead acid are basically the original type of leisure battery. They have lead plates covered with an acid, the clues in the name. These are the cheapest of the options I'm going to talk about and they work pretty well but there are a few characteristics worth knowing. They are heavy, they have a useful usage of around 50% of their capacity to maintain the health of the battery, i.e. a 100 ampere hour battery will only provide 50 ampere hours before it needs to be charged or its life cycle will be dramatically reduced and they must be used upright. AGM or absorbent glass mat batteries work in a similar way to sealed lead acid but use glass mat to hold the acid and have the same characteristics when it comes to discharging. They do offer more recharge cycles than lead acid batteries and you should check with the manufacturer but often they can be mounted on their side. Gel again work in a similar way to sealed lead acid and AGM but rather than having a liquid acid they have a gel as they're mainly used in vehicles that can tip over such as jet skis and quads. They can be mounted on their side. Finally, lithium iron phosphate or LIFE IP04. Leisure batteries are new and fundamentally different. They are built in battery management, some even include Bluetooth. Uh, they're much lighter than traditional batteries. They can pretty much be fully discharged without damage and can be mounted in any orientation. They are, however, very expensive. Although, do remember, with the useful power being nearly the full capacity of the battery, theoretically you only need half the power compared to lead acid, AGM or gel. And their projected lifetime is substantially longer than traditional batteries. Whichever battery type you choose, do make sure any charger you use can be set for the characteristics of the battery. If you're planning to stay off grid for any length of time, it's worth considering how you can keep your 12 volt usage to a reasonable level. The more efficient your load, the less you need to worry about how it's going to recharge and you can just relax. Using switches makes it easy to isolate the things you're not using, for example USB sockets or TVs on standby. Even though these only use a little bit of power, if they are continuously on, you will see an impact and every little saved helps. Your lighting is probably the most used 12 volt appliance and LED is definitely the way to go with significantly lower power usage for the same light output compared to the traditional halogen or fluorescent. When selecting appliances like TVs, stereos and fridges, if I can, I always go for native 12 volt appliances. There's nothing to stop you using a mains powered appliance through an inverter, but you lose efficiency and therefore waste power every time you alter the voltage up and down. 12 volt powered equipment is usually designed to use less power by being more efficient than similar mains powered equipment. 
For example, our 12 volt TV draws 1.4 amps from the battery. The same size and type mains power TV run through the inverter draws 4.8 amps. Although it is possible if you are touring in an area of plenty of strong sunshine with a high end, high efficiency and therefore expensive solar and battery setup, heating or cooking via battery in my opinion is not viable. Either gas or diesel being far more efficient and simple sources of power for these appliances. You can check out our thoughts on van heating options by clicking this link. Once you've picked the equipment you're going to have, calculating your load is pretty easy. First, make a list of all your 12 volt appliances. Then measure or look up the amount of electrical current in amps that they will use. Consider how long you'll use them for per day. Always consider the worst case scenario here. So I've included you having a shower and a 12 volt fridge running at a 50% duty cycle. By then timesing the amps and the hours per day, you can work out your daily usage in ampere hours. Then think about the time you're planning to be off grid. It's worth considering how long you want to be able to run without any recharging, e.g. if the weather is poor, you're not driving anywhere and you're not able to plug in. In this example, for that loading, the following battery sizing would give you 24 hours usage without any recharging. Before we look in detail at some of the charging options, thinking about how you plan to use your van will help you pick the best methods for you. If you're planning to be stationary and off-grid for any length of time, solar is a good option. If you're planning on driving a reasonable distance regularly, perhaps from off-grid site to off-grid site, then charging from your vehicle's alternator is a good thing to consider. Or if you're only ever planning on staying on a campsite with an electric hookup, then a mains charger will suit this, keeping your batteries topped up when you travel between sites. You may also consider having all of the above, which is what we have. In addition, we also sometimes carry a small, quiet Honda generator as a final backup. Wind turbines are another option, but the hassle of setting it up and taking it down when you're traveling, plus the noise and vibration has per personally made me discount this. Let's look in more details at the most common ways to recharge. Solar is a great way to charge your laser battery and is chosen by many. You can check out our separate detailed video on solar by clicking up here or there's links at the end of the video and in the notes. When you visit a site with mains hookup or while at home, you can take advantage of the various types of mains powered battery chargers. Some built into caravan and motorhome distribution panels are simply dumb power units that are unlikely to fully charge a modern battery and are likely to impact its performance over time. Where possible, I'd avoid these, along with dumb single stage battery chargers. You can buy budget smart chargers which give limited stage charging capabilities to keep your battery in good condition. You may find these slower or not capable of charging a larger battery bank, but they are an option to consider. Be conscious that although very reasonably priced, the cheaper units need to be reset to the same mode every time they're connected. At the higher end of the market, there are multi-stage chargers from the likes of SeaTech that you can size to suit your battery bank. These will keep your battery in top condition. They usually come with extended warranties and additional functionalities such as temperature sensing for optimal charging of your batteries. Finally, there are modern built-in smart chargers with multiple stages and some may even have a combined unit with an inverter. A reasonably simple way to charge your batteries is via the alternator already in your van. Historically, the simplest way to do this was to use a split charging relay. Essentially, this connected the starter battery to the laser battery whenever the engine was running, theoretically preventing the starter battery from being depleted too much to start the vehicle. Things have moved on a bit now with voltage sensitive relays, slightly smarter than split charging. These sense the level of charge in the starter battery and connect the leisure battery only when the starter battery is fully charged. Some also run in reverse, allowing your starter battery to be charged from your leisure battery when your leisure battery is fully charged. 
both split and VSR charging aren't great, they're not smart enough to phase how the leisure battery is charged and the most efficient way to get it full, meaning it will take longer or even never get full. If you have a newer van with a smart alternator, you'll need a battery to battery charger or B2B. And even if you haven't got a smart alternator, these are the most efficient way to charge your leisure battery, providing multi-stage charging to keep your battery in top condition and charged efficiently. When it comes to installation and monitoring your batteries, for installation and fault finding, a multimeter is pretty much an essential item. Fuses are an essential part of your system, they need to be suitably sized just more than the appliance that they are protecting. The objective of the fuse is to automatically isolate a circuit if a fault develops or a short circuit occurs, preventing overloading of the circuit and potentially fire. Once you've got your 12 volt system up and running, you'll probably want to be able to keep track of how much power you have or are using. You can get wiring voltage monitors. The quality and accuracy of these vary, but even if the figures aren't quite accurate, they will probably show the trend in your usage. To help the accuracy, wire them as close to the leisure battery as you can with suitably sized cable. If you fit a solar controller, most of these have a load output which you can connect most of your 12 volt equipment to. The controller will then monitor this and allow you to see your actual usage and historic usage alongside the amount of charge from your panels. You can also preset a shutoff voltage so that you don't risk damaging your batteries by letting them drop too low. Do check the load rating of the output on your solar controller as higher current devices like inverters may not be as suitable and these should be connected direct to the battery. When it comes to sizing the cables for your appliances, make sure to check some of the online guides to help pick the right cable for the appliance and the distance you're running the cable. Not only does it mean your appliances might not function correctly, having an undersized cable runs the risk of it overloading and causing a fire. Once you get your head around it, the concept of your 12 volt system is reasonably easy. I hope the video is useful. Remember we have other videos covering heating, bridges, tips and hacks, along with videos of our trips in our channel. So hit the subscribe button to check them out.